Um, I'm Charlotte. I'm the patient advocacy manager here at Leukemia Care, and I will be um, hosting today's webinar. Uh, so today we're here to talk about um, CML treatments, what's currently available, and, and possibly a bit about what may be available in the future. Um, so just by way of a bit of housekeeping, we won't be allowing anyone to um, sort of raise your hand or um, share your video or speak. Um, it'll be just the panellists that are doing that today. Um, if you'd like to raise a question, and we would be really, really interested in, in hearing the questions you want to ask our panellists, please do um, use the chat function instead, uh, which you can probably find towards the bottom of your screen, and there's a little messaging bubble there that you can use. If you're on Facebook, um, feel free to leave comments, and we will um, be able to answer those questions as well. we'll um, I've got someone passing them over to me to allow me to do that. So. Um, I think we'll um, do some quick introductions for the rest of the panel before we go on to our first speaker. So, um, Melanie, would you mind just introducing yourself for me? Hi, I'm Melanie and I'm a fellow CML patient. I was diagnosed in 2017. Great, thank you. And look forward to hearing your thoughts on today's topic later. Um, uh, next, we'll go to Mari. Hello everyone, I'm Mary Copeland, I'm Professor of uh, Haematology at the University of Glasgow and I've got a specific interest in chronic myeloid leukaemia and clinical trials. Great, thank you. And uh, last but not least, Adam. Hello, my name is Adam Mead. I'm a haematologist based in Oxford, um, where I also take, have a specialist interest in, in chronic myeloid leukaemia and myeloproliferative neoplasms and also run a research group here at the university. Uh, studying the biology of those diseases. Great, thank you. And um, you're our first speaker, so I'll just hand straight over to you for our um, first presentation, if you don't mind. Okay, uh, let's see if I can share my screen successfully. Oh, host disabled participant screen sharing, it says. Let me fix that for you. Okay, so hopefully if you press the button again, you should now have permissions to share. Great. And if I share, uh, then it should come up with my... Um, uh, can you see my PowerPoint screen? We can, but it's not full screen yet. Perfect. Yes, that looks great. Thank you, Ed. Right. Okay, so um, in the next 10 minutes or so, my remit was to uh, just give you a kind of broad overview of, of the, the diagnosis of chronic myeloid leukemia from a clinical perspective and thinking about what the kind of standard first line treatments are and things as clinicians and patients we need to think about um, you know during the early uh, diagnostic period so so the first thing just as a, a kind of very uh, overarching background this is you know a picture that shows you what CML looks like down the microscope which is you know as, as hematologists and blood specialists this is more or less now how we nearly always diagnose CML so Patients often have non-specific symptoms, should we say, of you know just feeling tired or constitutional symptoms of losing weight, night sweats, and go to their GP for a blood test. And this is what a normal film, typically blood film, looks like. So you, you put the blood cells onto a little glass slide, look at them under the microscope, and these are normal white blood cells that, that, that fight, that, that are responsible for fighting infection. These ones here are the red blood cells. And these little purple dots here are the platelets. So in patients with CML, it, it looks quite abnormal. First thing you would spot is that there's far too many white blood cells compared to a normal situation. And the red blood cells look fairly normal. And uh, the white blood cells that are there look abnormal. So there are some um, cells that look like this that are what we call precursors. Um, so not, you know, they're earlier forms of the blood cells that should normally live in the bone marrow, but spill out into the blood in this condition. So there's a very characteristic appearance of CML when we look under the, the microscope that prompts us as blood specialists to think about sending off the next range of tests. And those are really the, the, these ones, you know, CML is a, is a particular disease that is specifically um, characterized by a, a damaged uh, genetic uh, event, what we call chromosomes with, within each cell. 
and in patients with CML, two particular chromosomes, we number the chromosomes one to 22, and then the X and Y. And, and chromosome nine and chromosome 22 get damaged and, and stick together when they shouldn't normally stick together. And that's called the, the Philadelphia chromosome. And that's been known for quite a long time. But now we can detect that Philadelphia chromosome uh, using two different techniques that are important to have heard of if you've got a diagnosis of CMR. One of them is, is quantitative PCR, or so-called qPCR, and that's the test that we use to measure the PCR able level or PCR able transcript. But, but if, you're, if you've got CML and you're on treatment, you'll be discussing that regularly with, with your doctor. And the other is something called fluorescent in situ hybridization, which is directly looking at cells. So these blue blobs are cells, and the green and the um, red dots inside them are, are a, a marker of the two different chromosomes, chromosome 9 and chromosome 22, that, that normally you know, are quite separate from each other. And, and then in, in the presence of a Philadelphia chromosome, you find that the green and the blue kind of stick together. So you get a yellow um, blob within in the cell. So either the PCR or the, or the FISH test are, are together with the characteristic appearances down the microscope. That's what allows us to make a very clear diagnosis of chronic myeloid leukemia. And, and you know, what? Why is all that kind of jargon and information, if you like, about the, the genetics so important? Well, you know, CML is really a, a paradigm across all different kinds of blood cancer and beyond blood cancer for why the detection of a specific molecular abnormality like the Philadelphia chromosome, otherwise known as the BCR able, they're, they're kind of same thing. This is the chromosome, this is the molecular abnormality caused by the chromosome. And whilst that's been known for decades and over the years, we've gradually learned more and more about it to the point that about 20 years ago now, we, we developed the targeted treatment against the BCR able that was causing the disease. And, and you know, that was very, very prominent featuring on the cover of Time magazine and because this is a so-called you know, magic bullet directly targeting um, the mutation that causes the disease. And because of this understanding and these developments, we're now able to very sensitively monitor response to the treatment. And thankfully now the outcome for most CML patients is, is now um, approaching that of a normal population. So, so the understanding of, of the, the underlying genetic abnormalities have really moved us from a phase when I started off in hematology in the 1990s, where uh, you know CML, you know, if patients were eligible, you would try your very best to take patients forward for a bone marrow transplantation. And we've gradually moved from a situation where the focus is on preventing the disease progressing um, and just controlling the blood counts to a stage where we're trying to forever get deeper and deeper emissions. So a complete cytogenetic remission major molecular remission and deep molecular remission. So the goalposts are changing as we're getting more and more ambitious uh, for uh, our patients. And, you know, in parallel with those uh, terrific advances, life expectancy in patients with CML uh, has also dramatically improved. So the blue dots here for men and women are, are the expected life expectancy for the normal population. And this is what's happened for CML patients over the decades. And you can see from here, imatinib just becoming available. The lines are now uh, approaching uh, those of the normal population, which is you know, just such a terrific and really uh, important advance. And that means actually, you know, because patients are responding very well to the treatments that we've got available, more and more, it's important to think about other diseases because people are living with CML for many, many years. It's important to consider uh, other, what we call comorbidities. And actually the strongest predictor of how, of the prognosis uh, for patients with chronic myeloid leukemia is not actually the leukemia itself, but, but what are those so-called comorbidities patients have? And one really important part of the assessment for patients with CML, therefore, now is, is to make sure we thoroughly assess other uh, health problems. So, for example, cardiovascular disease, presence of diabetes, 
uh, and and so on and so forth because those are the problems that people run into in a way more often than problems directly relating to the CML. So in terms of um, the treatments that are available for the for uh, CML in, in the UK, the standard first line treatment is the one that has been uh, around now for for twenty years in the uh, in the UK and internationally, imatinib. But in certain patients, we might consider these drugs that are the second generation agents, uh, pasutinib, dasatinib, and nilotinib. Um, and we might consider using those up front as a first line treatment. But typically the situation now in a real world study, we looked how many people were getting first line imatinib. About eight out of 10 people diagnosed with CML in the UK received first line treatment with imatinib. And these second generation agents, including uh, a kind of third generation agent, if you like, ponatinib. Um, the, these are reserved for patients that don't respond optimally to, to the imatinib. And the choice of whether you use imatinib up front versus those more powerful drugs is really based on balancing um, this assessment of comorbidities, assessments relating to the, to the leukemia itself, um, balanced against the more potent activity of the second generation agents, which might have, have um, more side effects associated with them. And that's very much an individual decision that the patient and, and their hematologist will make together when they are diagnosed with CML. So we conducted this real world study across 250 patients in the UK with CML and, and uh, used that to kind of uh, really benchmark how patients were managed in the UK and benchmark that against the guidelines that we've just written uh, for, um, for the management of CML in the UK, the British Society of Hematology guidelines. So as I've said, the recommendations are imatinib for most patients as a first line treatment, consider a more potent second generation treatment for certain patients with high risk disease, or if you really want to drive down the disease to a very, very low level and possibly consider stopping the treatment at some point. Very important to carefully assess other comorbidities and particular cardiovascular risk factors, because that can be really helpful in deciding the choice of second generation agents, should those be required. And in terms of once you've started the treatment, in terms of the response that, that one aims to achieve, you know, these are the standard milestones. So I mentioned at the beginning the BCR-ABLE um, molecular test that we use for patients. And, you know, that basically gives a percentage uh, um, to, to the disease in any given patient at any given time. And then we have particular milestones that we measure the level of disease after starting the treatment. So typically every three months, three months, six months, and a year. And this kind of traffic light system help, helps give a guide for what, what we are hoping to achieve for patients. So the green is the kind of very best, what we call optimal response. So that would mean less than 10% at three months, less than 1% at six months, and less than 0.1% so-called major molecular remission uh, at, at one year. And that's really important because we know achieving these milestones strongly correlates with a reduced risk of any complications directly relating to the leukemia. And now, as I mentioned, we're getting even more ambitious um, for patients to try and drive down the disease to a super low level, something called a deep molecular remission. Because when patients have been on the treatment and in a deep molecular remission for a prolonged period, some patients were able to actually stop the treatment. Unfortunately, some patients still do not achieve these milestones. And there's a kind of amber uh, zone, if you like, when you just have to watch a patient more closely and, and run some further tests. But there are some patients where the first line imatinib doesn't work as well as we would like. And those that's the red on the traffic light system where, where you, you might consider switching to a more powerful treatment. And that the measurement, the kind of percentages, I think uh, it, it's, it's useful to think of them as a measure of the amount of leukemia left in the body. So if, it, if at the beginning of a diagnosis, there's, if you clumped all the leukemia cells together and made them into a, a kind of blob of disease, then at the, at the beginning, there'd be a kind of rugby ball size shape of disease. And 
And for patients getting less than 1%, you know, you've got that rugby ball down to a, a walnut. And to achieve a molecular response, it's right down to a tiny grain of rice. And then even deeper response is probably less than a grain of sand. So you're trying to get the levels lower and lower and lower all the time. And that's why measuring these responses on, uh, are so important. So one thing I think it's important, because I think it's really important, patients are empowered as much as possible, particularly with CML, but across all kind of blood cancer, to understand the importance of the tests that they should have and when they should have them. And, you know, I mentioned the real world study we carried out because there's still quite a few patients uh, who are not always having these blood tests exactly when they should, should be having them. So, uh, you know, three months is a really important time point, six months is and 12 months. And you can see whilst most patients having the blood tests uh, at, at those time points, some people aren't. And I, and I think um, it's really important to try and get those blood tests done carefully at these internationally agreed time points in the journey as, as patients respond to the treatment so that we can properly assess um, how well people are responding according to international criteria. And, you know, that's kind of now backed up in our British Society of Hematology guidelines where we specifically recommend, you know, th three monthly monitoring of the blood tests. Um, I, I, you know, because it's only a 10 minute talk, I didn't really have time to talk about side effects of the treatments in any detail, but maybe that will come up in this part of the Q&A. But it's just to say trying to avoid side effects is, is not the best policy. So, um, you know, that's when assessment of, of comorbidities right at diagnosis is super important so that you can make sure it, it, we keep patients as healthy as possible uh, throughout. So thank you very much for listening. I'll stop sharing my slides now and hand over. Thanks, Adam. That was a really interesting overview. And I always love a nice analogy. So now I've got visions of rugby balls and walnuts and all sorts in my brain. <laughs> that was really interesting. Thank you for that. Um, I think we'll go straight over to Mari next, um, who's going to take us a bit further along than Adam did there. So we've heard about um, response and when we should potentially change TKI. So hopefully Mari will give us a more context on what happens if you do. Okay, sure. Yeah, I'm just going to try and share my screen. Yeah, no problem. Take your time. Okay, can you see my screen okay? Yep, that looks fine to me. Okay, so um, hello everyone. So I, I've been tasked with giving you an update about what happens when your treatment isn't going so well and um, maybe needing to think about a change in treatment or you've got treatment resistance. So what I was going to do is just give you a bit of an update about the recent guidelines in terms of resistance that were published last year. And then I'm going to talk about a few clinical trials, um, two of which were presented at ASH this year, which show new information about third generation TKIs, um, which I think will be of interest. I'm then going to briefly touch on the match point clinical trial, which is a UK study for, for blast phase patients, which again shows promising results. And I'm going to finish by telling you about the TASTER clinical trial, which will hopefully be coming to a centre near you in the future, and that's going to be for um, TKI failure. So, so this slide shows the um, milestone responses um, for First line treatment. So once you start on your TKI, these are the levels of response in terms of your BCR able level that your consultant is looking for. And according to the ELN guidelines, this is the same for first and second line treatment. So if you fail your first line treatment, which is likely to be imatinib, then we're still aiming for your BCR able level to be less than 10% at three months, less than 1% at six months and we still want you to be in major molecular mission at 12 months after you're starting your second drug. And the criteria for failure remain the same. 
We'd also um, strongly encourage that uh, a BCR-able kinase domain mutation is performed um, for those patients that have got um, treatment failure or a warning or if where a switch of TKI is being considered, because that can be really informative in terms of what's the best TKI to give someone, especially if there's a mutation. So thinking about what we do when there is failure of treatment, and this may be either due to resistance or intolerance, then we usually need to consider changing to an alternative TKI, um, particularly for failure in first line, because we have so many agents available to us. Sometimes it's much more um, helpful and straightforward to actually switch to a different TKI than try to increase the dose of the TKI a patient is already on, um, especially when that's associated with side effects. So the, the, the choice of a second line treatment um, in patients with resistance should be guided by um, assessment for bcr able kinase domain mutations. And if there are specific mutations there, then the TKI that a patient has switched to should be guided by that. For some patients, a dose escalation to 600 milligrams of imatinib may be reasonable, but they would need to have extremely good tolerance to a standard dose of imatinib. And if I'm being honest, I can't remember the last time I did that. I have usually switched a patient to a second generation TKI rather than try and increase the imatinib. But, but that's something that you could do if, if a patient was motivated to try a higher dose of imatinib and their bcr able levels may be hovering around 10% at three months and they were tolerating extremely well. In the absence of specific mutations or in the case of intolerance, then pre-existing conditions, so conditions such as heart disease, diabetes, lung disease, and then the known side effect profiles of the different drugs should help to inform treatment choice. So for example, we wouldn't normally give nilotinib to a patient that had diabetes or ischemic heart disease unless they had a mutation that was only sensitive to nilotinib. And for a patient with lung disease or asthma, we would probably try and avoid dizatinib. I'm, I'm going to move on now to talk to, about, just very briefly about some of the new clinical trial data that was presented at the American Society of Hematology in December. And I think this really does give new hope and um, potential new treatment options for those patients that have already failed multiple um, TKIs. So the first study I'm going to present is called the ASSEMBLE study. And this um, was a study which compared the new tyrosine kinase inhibitor, Asimunib, which works slightly different to imatinib and the other TKIs. It binds to a different part of the bcr able molecule, so it's not subject to the same mutations. Um, and this was compared with Busutinib, which is quite a standard third-line treatment for patients with chronic phase CML. And this was a, a study that was conducted in many centres across the world, including a few centres within the UK. And we were one of those centres in Glasgow. And I think Adam was in Oxford as well. So this is just looking at one of the results from that study. And it's looking at the incidence of molecular response in bisutinib compared to asimunib. And this is at the six month time point. And you can see at six months that responses are superior to asimunib as compared to bisutinib. So by, by six months, 12% of patients having bisutinib had achieved a major molecular emission compared with 25% of patients on asimunib, which is quite a big difference in, in third line setting and a 25% rate, 25 response rate in third line is also very promising. Looking at the side effect profile of asimunib, because this is obviously critical, and we've got asimunib in green and basutinib in blue. And you can see that um, for the basutinib, it, it does have a less favorable side effect profile, particularly with problems with diarrhea and nausea, which are well known with basutinib. If we look at the levels of 
low platelets and low neutrophils, they're similar between the two drugs. And, and for other adverse events, generally the assimilant performed better. So we think this is a very safe drug. I'm not presenting the data today, but within this trial, there was no evidence for cardiac um, toxicity. So it didn't seem to cause blood clots or strokes or heart attacks but there's still relatively early data with this drug. So it continues in clinical trials, but we're very optimistic that it will hopefully be approved maybe next year for um, use within the UK by NICE and SMC. Um, and that would be probably in the third line setting as an alternative to panatinib. And um, so that looks very promising. The second study I'm going to present is the OPTIC study. Again, this was conducted um, across many centres across the world, including centres within the UK. And panatinib is a drug, as I'm sure you know, that has been around for a number of years, but has had its problems, sorry, in terms of um, toxicities and specifically um, concerns about toxicities to the heart and blood clots. So this study looked at different doses of panatinib, so starting at um, either a very low dose, an intermediate dose or high dose, and then all patients reducing to the low dose once they ach achieved a response. And they also looked at side effect profiles and specifically cardiac side effect profiles in these patients to see how that was affected by the dose reductions. So this is looking at the response rates and the different doses that they used in, in green, and then the levels of um, cardiac events, so blood clots are in red. So the, the first thing to say is, since the original panatinib studies were done, we have got much better at managing patients on panatinib, and the actual rate of um, cardiac events is very much lower in this study even in the 45 milligram treatment arm of panatinib. And that's because we are screening patients before they start panatinib, we're treating high blood pressure, we're treating high cholesterol, we're managing their diabetes better. Um, so from, from being much more aware of the sort of giving the drug in the whole patient and not just for their CML, we've actually been able to reduce the side effects. But you can see here that the responses are superior with the higher dose of panatinib, and I'm not presenting it here, but for those patients with a T315I mutation, they would still recommend the 45 milligram dose and not the lower dose. And you can see as well that as well as the response being dependent on the dose, the side effects are dependent on the dose as well with an increase in the risk of um, cardiac events in those patients on the higher doses with very low levels of cardiac events in those patients on the 15 milligram dose. But this needs to be balanced against the rate of response, which is about half that within the highest dose. I'm just very briefly going to touch on advanced phase CML, which I know is not where anybody wants to go. Um, but for those patients that are diagnosed in accelerated phase, ideally they should be treated with a second generation TKI first line, and I would generally use dizatinib at a higher dose of 140 milligrams daily. For those patients that don't achieve an optimal response to their first line TKI in accelerated phase, and if they have a suitable donor and they, they are consenting to it, then they should really be considered for an allogeneic stem cell transplant. And this should be something that's discussed really from diagnosis. So it's something that, that the patient can be prepared for. For those patients with blast phase CML, um, they may be considered for AML type chemotherapy. So much stronger type chemotherapy, either with, a, with or without a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And for those patients with advanced phase CML, looking at these bcr able kinase domain mutations is really critical because there's a much higher rate of, kinase, of these mutations in patients with advanced phase disease. The mutations occur within about one third of patients with resistance in chronic phase. It's around about two thirds of patients in advanced phase. 
And for all those patients with blast phase CML, they should proceed to allogeneic transplant if they have a suitable donor and they are um, fit enough to receive the procedure. So we have conducted a clinical trial within the UK, um, which has combined um, penatinib with um, AML type chemotherapy in patients with both lymphoid and myeloid blast phase. So we gave one or two cycles of the combination treatment and then patients proceeded to a stem cell transplant and thereafter they went on to penatinib maintenance. And what we wanted to do was identify an effective and tolerable dose of penatinib because we were extremely concerned about cardiac toxicity and we wanted to make sure that combining penatinib with transplant was also a safe option because penatinib is the most potent TKI. So it's, it's an obvious choice for those patients with advanced phase CML, but there was no safety data before this study. So this is looking at the levels of response and, and we were really very encouraged with this data. Um, so we actually saw responses within 11 of 16 patients um, and survival at 12 months was um, 47%, falling to 41% at two years. And I know this does not sound very good, but with panathenib on its own, survival at one year is around about 20% and almost zero by two years. So this is actually really encouraging. And for those patients that had a transplant and continued in remission, they remained in remission now out to around about four years. Finally, I'm going to talk about the TASTER clinical trial, um, which is funded by Cancer Research UK through the Stand Up to Cancer campaign. And this is a clinical trial um, for patients with TKI resistance in chronic and accelerated phase. The trial is currently paused effectively due to COVID-19 because we've been unable to open um, sites due to the pandemic and recruit patients. At the moment, the trial has two arms. So there's a, a TKI only control arm, and then there's a TKI in combination with tazemetostat arm. And tazemetostat is a drug that has been widely used in lymphoma. And within our laboratory studies, um, it shows very effective um, eradication of CML cells. So we're combining that with TKI to try to improve responses for patients that have failed other TKI options. For those patients that end up on the control arm of the study, so they have to continue on their current TKI, we, we're giving them the option at around about six months to actually switch on to the control arm of this study so that they would have the option to benefit from the control arm as well. And we're also exploring options for additional arms within this study to test other combinations. So I, I know treatment resistance is, is one of your biggest concerns, but I'm hoping that I've sort of showed you that there are options out there and there are new things coming along all the time. And it's really important to discuss these options with, with your consultant and, you know, just to have a, a clear plan going forward about what the alternatives might be. And I'll stop there and I, I will stop sharing my screen. Great. Thank you for that. That was really, really interesting. And um, we've got a number of questions, but I wanted to bring in our other panellists before we sort of dive deep into some of that. So, um, Joe, did you want to introduce yourself briefly now you've joined us? Uh, okay. We, I can hear you now. Oh, no, you've uh, muted yourself again. Okay. I think I can hear you. Yeah. I'm using a, an Apple MacBook for the first time, so apologies. <laughs> In you complicated. Uh, sorry, I was late. I was I was removed and I became a pariah. I had to go through uh, the back door to, to join you. Uh, my name is Joanna Large. I'm the uh, nurse specialist for um, CML at King's College Hospital, which is in Camberwell in South London. And we're 
uh, one of the tertiary referral centers for sort of Kent and the Southeast um, area. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me today. Great, thank you for joining us. Um, so in terms of starting off the q and I thought I'd come to Melanie first, and I thought it would be good to, um, we've had a lot of information already, but let's, uh, I think, go back to the point of diagnosis. And I wonder whether, Melanie, you could um, just tell us a bit about how it was for you to try and understand all these particular treatment options at that point, and if if you had any advice for somebody else who may be listening who's in the same position at that point. Um, well, when you first get diagnosed and all the information is thrown at you, it's a bit hard to understand everything. Um, what I did is I understood I was going to take a tablet for the rest of my life. That's what I understood. And I was sent home with lots of, well, uh, leukemia care and blood wise and now, now blood cancer UK. Uh, I was sent home with lots of those booklets and I think I read them all within a week. So I knew what was going on and I knew there were other options too. Mm -hmm. And did it feel, did all that information feel overwhelming or was that useful to you to be able to have the time to sort of read in, in, in the background? I think it was useful for me because understanding what was going on helped me come to terms with it. Mm -hmm. um, but it might be overwhelming for other people. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And Joe, I wanted to bring you in at this point to, I guess, ask how you support patients. So they've been given a diagnosis, presumably by your consultant colleagues and talked through a treatment option. But how do you help them come to terms with this treatment that they're having to probably take for a significant period of time, if not the rest of their life? Yeah, I mean, it, it's difficult and and uh, I think any experienced medical or nursing practitioner will have the sense to tailor it to um, the person in front of them, albeit that obviously comes with some, you know, some presumptions. Um, we, it is good practice for uh, diagnosis to be broken um, by a consultant in uh, with a, a clinical nurse specialist with them. So that's actually one of the things that we're, we're measured against um, in terms of cancer services across the NHS. And yeah, some people want a lot of information and I think it's as well to fill that gap with sources that you trust rather than leaving them to Dr. Google and message boards and other places where the information might be more erroneous. Uh, and confusing and not relevant to them. I generally try to have a, a longer period talking to them first in person. Sometimes that's the first visit, sometimes the second. Normally we have a sense that somebody's got CML before it can be confirmed. And I never race to offer the uh, offer the reassurance which is very tempting in CML that you you know you're going to be fine it's going to be uh, a tablet every day for the rest of your life and um, often you often we have patients come to us who have been told things along the lines of um, well of all the cancers you could get this is probably the best one which <laughs> I don't think is helpful to anybody and it's especially not helpful to the sizable chunk of people for whom this won't be an easy solved uh, disease um, to find not only that have the fickle finger of fate given them something unexpected but it's also put them in a higher risk category and um, and there can be feelings of personal failure um, that run alongside that which you know aren't merited but are certainly human and uh, so I tend to have uh, I try to have a very good talk with people uh, have some for myself some understanding of their understanding um, tell them things that are useful but not necessarily medically helpful that you know using faith uh, can be really important but it won't change the CML uh, and anticipating anticipating pro, uh, problems uh, further ahead that, that, uh, that one has encountered in their practice in the past and I guess all of us who have worked in CML for you know a long time will have seen all sorts of incident, incidences of 
of misunderstanding, whether that's be that people take words like remission as cure, and therefore I can come off the tablets. I've seen that a, a couple of times, and those patients have ended up coming to us um, rather late in the day. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of things to be, to be communicated. I tend to start off with a kind of similar, uh, a simple metaphor about socks in a drawer that your, you know, your chromosomes are like pairs of socks and your Christmas socks have joined up with your stripy socks and they're taking over all the socks in the drawer. And sometimes it, that's, you know, a nice uh, simple uh, metaphor for, for, for people to understand. And, you know, other people want a lot more than that, obviously. Great, thank you. I always like it when you share that uh, socks in the drawer. Yeah, I think you shared that on another webinar. It's great. Um, I think, Melanie, I wanted to come back to you just on something that Joe said there um, about a sizable chunk of people who, for, for whom it isn't a smooth ride. And we've heard from Adam about first line treatments and when to change. And we've heard from Mari about potential other options. Would you mind just sharing sort of your journey, which I know has not been the smooth ride um, that it could have been? Yeah, well, I've so far I've been on all TKIs, including the Simonib, and I even tried uh, interferon alpha or PEG inter interferon actually. Um, the problem is not responding to medication from a BCR ABL point of view. It's I'm extremely sensitive to the side effects. And I get side effects even at ridiculous doses that are tiny, tiny. So I'm currently on 200 milligrams of nilotinib a day which is really quite low uh, and I still get side effects from that. So I thought it interesting that you invited me for this because I thought, well, I can tell everybody about all TKIs because I've had them all. I think that, yes, that was, it, it's, it's useful, but uh, even though it may not resem represent everybody's experience, but you, you do know what it's like to switch and you know what it's like to, to have tried them all. And maybe a good question is, it, it, are there, are there really distinct differences between them that you could tell? Definitely, there are clear differences between them. Um, on panatinib, even though I was taking it only alternate days, I had such bad brain fog, I had a hard time talking to people. And with pazutinib, you've got the famous GI um, side effects, so um, an upset stomach and an upset bowel, so it was hard to leave home. Um, on nilotinib, I got on the higher dose, I got a really bad rash all over from head to toe. Literally, I had a rash on my scalp and on all the way to my feet. I think the soles of my feet and the palms of my hands escaped, but that was it. So that's all quite different one to the other. Yeah. And, it, oh, and maybe let's just uh, finish your, the, the story off. I mean, where are you at now? What, what, to, what do you understand to be the options? Yeah, out of everything I tried so far, nilotinib 200 milligrams has been the best. And it's something I had tried earlier and, and came back to a, a lower dose. Um, and it's holding me in complete cytogenic response. So that's good. Um, and I, I've been finding ways to manage the side effects. And one thing I just wanted to make clear is I'm a bit of an exception. So if you're listening to this, please don't think that what happened to me will necessarily happen to you. I think what your story does illustrate is that balance that I think is discussed a lot in ZML between the response and the quality of life. And maybe this is where I could bring you in, Adam, because you did begin to talk about this a little bit towards the end of your talk. Because how do you as a clinician uh, deal with that when someone comes to you and says I'm really struggling with this particular drug um, but they've got a good response is that a difficult conversation to to have and how do you cope with that yeah I, I, I think you know that's one of the you know jobs of the hematologist looking after patients with CML is for any individual patient you know really sit and listen to how it's affecting them as an individual and and, and you know you've got to make a balanced judgment um, that that is kind of nuanced for because everyone's different, right? And 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 in some people there are side effects, but you know we as clinicians use this 
horrible term that we write in letters and say, oh, it's manageable, <laughs> manageable side effects. But in some people that there are, you know, so-called low grade side effects that are manageable. And you have that conversation with people because the risk is always, and there's no way around the uncertainty of switching a treatment. The risk is always you switch to a new treatment and, and it's worse and the side effects are, are worse. So you have to reach that judgment. But, in, in you know, in some cases, there's no question it's an easy decision, right? In some cases, there are intolerable, you know, side effects that are just really impacting on people's quality of life. And as we've discussed, you know, these are treatments often that, that we're considering long term for people. And we really don't want anyone to end up long term on a treatment that is just really negatively impacting their quality of life you know we do, that's our job to try and find a treatment that lets people get on with their life so that that's the balance you've got to make in an, in an individual case and um you know I, I guess what i've learned over the years is you know unless it's a really clear cut decision not necessarily to rush into a decision about changing a treatment sometimes you can you know um, tweak things a bit in terms of, you know, interrupting the treatment, let the side effect resolve. And, and for reasons that I still don't understand, and I don't think I ever will, you can stop a treatment and start it again, and the same side effect that people did have doesn't come back. And it doesn't make sense to me, it doesn't make, but, but it happens. Or you can stop the treatment and start again and reduce the dose. So I guess what I'm saying is it's complicated. You have to individualize your decision making for any uh, particular patient. And, and, you know, it partly depends on where they are in their journey with CML, you know, how well they're responding to a treatment and so on. Great, thank you. And um, um, Mary, one thought I was having there while Adam was speaking was about the uncertainty of changing between treatments. And you talked a lot about clinical trials, but I noticed there wasn't much about um, ability to predict a response. Is there any work ongoing in that area in terms of predicting how someone will respond at diagnosis or when they change? Is that something that CML doctors and researchers are still interested in? So it is something that we look at at diagnosis. So, so we do what's called prognostic scoring at diagnosis, where we look at the number of primitive cells, we look at the size of the spleen, we look at the platelet count and all that goes into a score and that tells us how likely you are to respond to your TTI. And that is what puts you into high, intermediate and low risk categories. So we, we have that for each patient, but it's, it's not an exact science. And those patients in high risk have a kind of 12% chance or so of not responding to their TKI and those in low risk, it's three or 4%. So even if you're in a low risk category, there's still a chance that you won't respond. So we, we definitely do do that. There aren't really um, other scoring categories once you've started on treatment, they're all, they're all done at baseline and switching treatment is based on looking for mutations and looking at side effect profiles of drugs and other conditions that a patient may have. Um, but yeah, yeah we, we do look at that and we would discuss with someone if we thought they were very high risk and we might even at diagnosis then raise the possibility that a transplant might in the future be needed so it doesn't kind of come out of the blue at six months when everything's gone horribly wrong. And hopefully, um webinars like this can help share all the options because um, you can't always predict and it's always useful to have that information in the back pocket definitely. Um, someone's asked an interesting question about long-term side effects and whether there's any sort of long-term harms of being on a treatment for a significant period of time. Um, I wonder Adam if you wanted to comment on that if there are are we aware of any sort of side effects that pop up after you've been on TKIs for a significant period of time? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, particularly when we're dealing in many patients with treatments where we are, you know, recommending that, that they stay on lifelong. Um, and I, I think it varies a lot from between the different, uh, between the different drugs. Actually, imatinib, the kind of you know, still the kind of mainstay of the treatment in CML, it, it, you know, because we've been using it for the longest time, I guess there we've got the most experience with it. And, and the data is pretty 
actually pretty reassuring with the long-term use of, of, of imatinib. Now, of course, people can um, develop side effects at any stage, but typically the side effects with imatinib occur relatively early. And um, you know you manage them during the first few months of the treatment rather than as a as a late effect. I think with some of the different TKIs, it is a little bit different, and it's nuanced depending on the on e each uh, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So, for example, I mean I don't want to go through an exhaustive list, but for example, with nilotinib, uh, there is a concern with nilotinib about possible increased risk of vascular disease. And you know that 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 occurs you know with time. So there's a really important you know, and in a way, we're, you know, CML is a disease you know where we've been so successful in the treatment in in most patients at least that we are dealing with very prolonged periods on the treatment. So that for me is a really really important consideration for nilotinib, but actually for other second generation TKIs as well that you really need to think about other. What we call vascular risk factors for checking for diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, cholesterol, and making sure those things are really well controlled. Because I, I think you know that that is a potential concern. With dasatinib, there are other concerns. So the dasatinib, the the one side effect that that you know everyone always thinks of with uh, as clinicians with dasatinib is is pleural effusion, so collection of fluid around the lung, and uh, that can occur at any time. You know, even after many years on the treatment, it can, you know, pop up for reasons that aren't well explained. So, so there are potential, and you know, the, the same for pasutinib and same for panatinib. There are uh, potential things that, that, that can occur uh, later on, but mostly the, the, the side effects tend to occur early if you're going to, if you're going to see them. But it's important, I, I guess, for what you're saying about some of the things that could pop up is just to be conscious of how you're feeling over time and to raise any concerns yeah, and not to become yeah. compliant. If you've got compliant. any doubt uh, about something, you know, raise it with your haematologist, because, you know, yeah. because people are living a long time with, with CML, which is obviously, you know, really, you know, um, you know, testament to the, the, the success of many of the treatments, you know, it means people are developing other illnesses and problems that people otherwise would. So quite a common situation in CML is trying to make a judgment about whether this is just, just in inverted commas, a, a, an illness or problem that, that, that someone would have otherwise developed or whether it's somehow directly related to the TKI. Sometimes it's obvious. Many times it's not so obvious and you have to make a judgment call about it. And Ernie, the long-term side effects question made me think about another question for you in that, Again, at the point of diagnosis, when somebody tells you it's a treatment for life, is is that something that worries you as well as being a positive that you can get treatment? Does it concern you that did it concern you about the long term treatment plan for CML? No, I was more worried about the immediate side effects, to be honest. Um, with time, it's something I've worried about a bit more, but because I'm still very actively trying to manage the side effects I have, um, I personally, I don't spend much time thinking about it. Um, so if being on a TKI buys me 10, 15 years, I'm happy, even if it might give me heart disease in the future, or it might've been something I got anyway, as Professor Adam said. Yeah. Um, so that's for me, but I know it's not the case for everyone. Yeah. Definitely. I think it's, it's a challenge. And um, Joe, I, I wanted to come back to what you were saying earlier about compliance um, with all of this. So side effects can mean people don't fancy staying on their treatment for any longer. Um, how do you have that conversation with people and what, what, how do you prevent it and how do you deal with it once it's happened? Yeah, I think... I think, I mean, the term we know is, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not being, a, I'm not being bossy saying this, but I think the term we tend to use now is adherence, um, and I, I say that more because it is working in partnership. It's uh, we're not sort of, the days of of telling um, are sort of gone, and it is about uh, supporting people to be able to. Uh, 
to be able to manage what you really need, which is nigh on 100% um, adherence. Um, I think in all other studies of all other medications, non-adherence is actually the norm. Um, and I, speaking from experience, I don't think I've ever finished a packet of antibiotics in my life. And um, I think this is, you know, very human. Uh, and certainly some, uh, some very famous studies done by the Hammersmith um, uh, along, uh, done by Imperial uh, um, uh, a number of years ago, where they concealed a little uh, microchip in a lid showed that, that uh, adherence is extremely patchy. Uh, but it's when you saw the breakdown of why and how patients had, for example, admit omitted two weeks of, uh, of a matinib when they went to Spain, you know, it's, it's very understandable. If you're going on a family holiday and you don't want to have muscle aches or pains or, or loose bowels when you're in your bikini, you know, it's, it's very understandable. And as Adam said, it's about working with patients uh, as individuals um, to understand what they're going through, what their tolerance is, um, and to be able to, you know, work with them to make the call from switching from one thing to another. And sometimes switching sounds great. We've got something else to offer. But for a lot of people, it would be taking a step into, uh, into the unknown, um, into uncertainty, away from something they might feel, you know what, I take it most of the time and I tolerate it most of the time. I don't think I want to go to this different one. This is a, you know, an unknown. Um, but it is important to have very, very high levels of adherence. It makes a difference to the long, to the long term prognosis. Um, and it is, I think it's imperative on uh, staff working with, with all patients and certainly for us in the CML world to make sure that we're, we're supporting people um, as, much as, as much as we can and keeping those conversations open and giving people the, you know, a trusted therapeutic relationship to have with us where they feel that they can be honest. And it's, it's quite difficult to be honest and um, getting to know patients continuity of care uh, is really important in that because it's so much more, uh, it's, it's much easier to be honest with somebody that you know than it is to be honest with a different doctor every time uh, that you come in. Um, and I think that that sort of level, uh, that level of care that people receive is very important in, imagine, in uh, managing adherence. Thank you. That's really interesting. And um, Mel Melanie, I wanted to come back to you on that. As someone who's experienced a lot of side effects, did you um, ever, you know, have one of those days where you just didn't want to take these tablets? And how did you cope did. with that? It was my first month of imatinib, so my first month since being on hydroxycarbamide, and then I started imatinib, and I had my sister's wedding, so I purposefully skipped two tablets, um, so that I, I actually had to walk my sister down the aisle, and I was hobbling more than walking because of leg cramps, so I decided to do that. I told my hematologist I was going to do it. She didn't agree, but I still did it. <laughs> Um, and so far, it's the only one I skipped on purpose. And I've maybe forgotten about one per year, which isn't too bad. I think forgetting is probably one of the biggest drivers of adherence as well as <laughs> purposely doing that. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, and Barry, I wanted to ask you uh, uh, on, on this topic, is, um, is there any evidence that not taking the treatment frequently enough leads to resistance because I know that's something you're particularly interested in. I was just curious if there was any link there. So there's a, a very strong link so the Hammers, Hammersmith did a study a number of years ago the study that Joanna's mentioned where they put the microchip into the caps of the pill bottles and what they actually found was that anyone who missed one out of 10 tablets. So they were 90% compliant with treatment, but not 100%. If, if you missed more than one out of 10 tablets, you never achieved major molecular emission. So you never got down to those low levels of disease where you might be able to stop treatment in the future. So missing one day in 10 doesn't sound like very much, but actually it has a huge impact on um, your response to your CML treatment. 
That is really interesting. I agree, Sally, in the audience. That is really interesting. And you'd you'd assume something as small as one in 10 wouldn't make a difference, but no, very interesting. Um, there was one other question in the audience. Oh, yes, Adam, could you just um, go over what you were saying in, in terms of the numbers of and, and changing medication? So someone's recently changed due to resistance and they're wondering how the haematologist will basically define success from this new change. Yeah. They may have missed the presentation. So could you just go over that again for me? Yes, it's a, uh, you know, it's there are kind of set milestones that, that we that we try to um like patients adhere, we try to adhere as clinicians and patients to, to set time points for blood tests. So, so typically the first kind of key um, milestone is, is at three months. Um, and then, you, you know, three monthly thereafter. And, and there are certain goals that, that we're aiming to achieve. So less than 10% transcript level at three months in. Now it may be if, if one is switching to um, a second line treatment, then, then that, that is less relevant because you might have switched at less than 10% in the first place, but switch at three, uh, check at three months, six months, and then uh, at 12 months. And, you know, you're aiming at three months, less than 10%, six months, less than 1%, and uh, 12 months, less than 0.1%. Those are the kind of, you know, best, best case scenario responses. And then there's a kind of a warning area that where you haven't quite achieved those, but but you ne nearly have, and then then there's a kind of clear, not responding category where where uh, things aren't going uh, as well as we would like, and should think about an alternative treatment. I think those you know it's important to remember that although there's a lot of data to back up those those kind of thresholds that we're aiming for. There's also a little bit of nuance to the interpretation of the results. And I would just, you know, as I do to the patients I look after, make some kind of broad points that, that you know, that, you know it, it's a precise test, but it's not that precise. So you do see fluctuations up and, up and down and a little bit of what we would say noise in the data. So don't, I think it's important not to overinterpret a single result, you know, don't overinterpret a small shift because that can be noise in the data and a big jump in the data always makes me think, mm, you know, has something technically gone wrong, some kind of sample mix up or something. First thing to do is to repeat in that situation, just confirm uh, uh, the result. And th th so that's one thing to say, you know, there are technical noise and, you know, sometimes just not looking at a one off result is important. And, and kind of relating to that, I think, particularly when people have been established on treatment a little while, I think looking at, at, at the kind of gradual trajectory over quite prolonged periods can also be quite informative rather than comparing one result with the last one, actually going back, I've just been doing it in clinic uh, earlier on today with a patient, looking back over the last two or three years to see, even though there's a bit of fluctuation, actually taking that bigger picture over two or three years can be quite informative. And you can see the overall trajectory is a slow downward trend because often what happens in, in, in the results is you get a very steep drop initially in the treatment. And then it kind of much more gradually levels off or, or continues to drop beyond that. And the steep drop occurs during the first year. What about people who end up stable at not the deepest level, so stable at MMR or stable at a complete cytogenetic remission such as yeah. melanie? Should they be concerned? Because I do see people talking on Facebook groups and things about how they're worried that they're consistently stuck not at the at the lowest level. Should should they be worried? Well, I think it's it's you know it's again it, it has to be individualized as much as possible. I think it's important to remember that a complete cytogenetic remission, when I started off in hematology, which you know I'm not that old, that was a remarkable response. Yeah, and and you know we were said, wow, amazing, a complete cytogenetic response. That's that's fantastic. So and and you know there's a lot of benefit gained from a complete cytogenetic response. So less than one percent is a kind of, you know, it's a bit of a surrogate, but it's close enough to complete cytogenetic response. So um, um, so. Yeah, so that, that group where, where you're kind of in the, what bit, I think if you're not in a complete cytogenetic response category, category so above 1%, I do think, you know, if, if things are not going in the right direction and, and the levels are above 1%, despite a reasonable period of time on a, 
uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, then then that, that does meet criteria for a, a, you know failure of treatment and you know considering other options. I think then it becomes a bit more of a gray zone when you're less than one percent, and and it depends exactly where because some people level off around you know zero point one one percent, so not quite an MMR but nearly there. And I tend to be a little bit more relaxed in that situation. But if it's more a 0.9%, uh, I'm a little bit less relaxed and think, you know, we need to try and get, get that lower. So, you know, hopefully that helps answer the question. I think it's a little bit nuanced. I think there are some situations where it's clear cut and then there's a kind of gray zone in between where you have to work with the patient. You know, how well are they getting on with the treatment? What other options are available? What are the comorbidities? You know, what are the long term goals and expectations for, for the patient in, in terms of, um, um, you know, younger women wanting to have families and, and things, things. All these things are in the mix, right, to consider when, when making that judgment. Great, thank you. And I, I liked your point about the, you know, cytogenetic response being good a long time ago. It's, it's that thing you said about moving goalposts. So yeah. we expect more, but not everybody is going to get to these new deeper levels. I think it's a really important point. We're getting more and more ambitious for our, our patients. And, and so we should be. So we should be. But as the years go by, we're getting more and more and more ambitious in terms of what we want to achieve. But it is quite useful to say, as I get a bit older, you stop being able to have that historical perspective a little bit. And it is worth remembering that the, the kind of responses in patients, we're saying, oh, that, that's a, a warning category. It's still quite a terrific response in many ways. Yeah, definitely. Um, Mari, I wanted to ask you about clinical trials. So you've um, you presented quite a few clinical trials, but they, I think it, they tend to lean towards people who uh, discontinued other TKIs towards the end of um, their treatment options. Are there clinical trials that are options for people who are newly diagnosed? Um, is there a lot of work ongoing in other areas or is the work mainly focused at, towards the, the later stages of the, of the time being? So at, at the moment, there are actually very few trials in newly diagnosed patients because there are so many drugs available. Um, so for example, within the UK, we don't have a trial for newly diagnosed patients. Now there are a couple of new TKIs that are sort of being tested in patients with treatment resistance that if they show promise, they may come towards new treatments, but because we have so many options and actually the first line treatments are, are really, really effective, there's not really a huge appetite at the moment for new trials in newly diagnosed patients. In terms of patients further down the treatment journey, um, there are select trials for patients with treatment resistance, which, which I've presented today. And there's on and off, there have been treatment free remission trials. So trials for patients who want to attempt stopping treatment. But yeah, the and, and the, the, the trial landscape changes all the time in terms of what's available. Um, but because all the drugs or, or the five TKIs are proved by NICE for various indications, and it's actually incredibly difficult to get funding for CML trials at the moment because the companies are not really supportive. And a lot of the funders um, sort of think CML is really quite sorted because we've got all these drugs, but that doesn't really help the, you know, the, the third of patients that have had to go through different TKIs, have got intolerance or have, you know, like Melanie have cycled through all the different TKIs and have really struggled to find one that suits them. And um, so I think there's still a lot of work to do, especially in personalizing treatment for patients. I totally agree. And Melanie, did you want to comment on that? Do you think CML is a done deal? I'd probably say no, but I don't want to speak definitely, for you. Yeah, definitely not. It's something I've thought about. My sister's a scientist. Unfortunately, she doesn't work with hematology, but I, I, I tell her I wish she'd find a, a kinder TKI. <laughs> is that what you think you'd like to see in particular is the the quality of life side of things um, is the biggest unmet need. Definitely, yes. Um, and something I wanted to say to all other CML patients is, 
If you're also struggling with side effects like me, don't be quiet about it. Talk to your doctor about it and they can probably help you because I see lots of people in Facebook groups just stopping their medication because they can't tolerate the side effects, but that's only going to make things worse. So definitely speak up for yourself. My, I see Dr. Dragon in Hammersmith and she knows I do. <laughs> And she's been very helpful. Great. We've got a couple of uh, questions that have come in from the Facebook that I just want to make sure we've covered. Um, so someone is asking how common resistance is. I think maybe that one's one for you, Mari, if you don't mind, since you mentioned resistance in your talk. Um, yeah, and, and development of certain mutations is, is the question. Okay, so... I think the first thing to say is the majority of patients do respond to their first TKI. But for, for patients that go on a matinib first line, around about a third of patients will need to switch. And probably about half of those is due to resistance and about half of those is due to intolerance. And then for second line therapy, um, again, about 60% of patients with resistance will respond. So the majority of patients, we should be able to find a TKI that is suitable, especially if they have a, 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 a specific mutation. And it's really important to do mutation testing for patients at the point of switch to identify the most appropriate TKI so people don't end up on a TKI that's not going to work. Um, probably in, in terms of patients that sort of cycle through all the TKIs with resistance. Um, I, I think nowadays it's actually very few patients, I would say probably of the order of maybe around about 5% of patients. And for those patients, they would probably go on to receive an allogeneic stem cell transplant if they had a donor. And, and the patients that that is most likely to happen to is the patients that have low blood counts and they sort of serially have low blood counts with each of the TKIs and, the, and they don't respond. And I'd say that certainly within my practice, they are the patients that most commonly end up having a transplant for resistance is that the, you, you can't get enough drug into people for them to have a response or, and, and then when you do that, you know, their counts crash. And, um... I think somebody might have missed your talk, but just to um, clarify, the trial you presented about a simonib, the patients on that, were they largely people who didn't respond to all other TKIs? So, so, that, was, um, so that was a randomised study looking at a simonib and bisutinib. So that was in third line. So the patients couldn't have had a bisutinib before. So they needed to have either a matinib and nilotinib or a matinib and... Dizatinib. So we think a seminib is likely to be effective in people who have tried several TKIs was the, the question that they, they asked. I think so and certainly um, I've, I've seen very good efficacy within my population but it's, it's a small number of patients and obviously everyone is different but it does look very promising. And there's one um, question in um, in the chat is quite lengthy, but I think I can um, summarise by saying there's a, a some a particular compound known as berberine that is um, being investigated for CML. It, just looking at the title of the paper, it seems to suggest it's a trial that's currently in the lab. Um, are you aware of this particular compound, and what would you say to people who are looking at lab trials and the likelihood of them making it into patients? I have heard of berberine and I've heard of um, autophagy and we do actually have a, a group leader in Glasgow who's working on autophagy and we had published a study last year looking at um, hydroxychloroquine which is a rheumatology drug um, which acts by inhibiting autophagy within CML cells but at, at the doses that you're able to give patients without causing intolerable side effects it didn't have an effect on autophagy within CML cells. And I just wonder if that would be the same with the berberine. Often with these natural compounds, you really need to give very large amounts in order to give an effect. And that's that's not practical. That's the, the difference between a, a 
trial or an experiment that's done in the lab and a tri- and the reason why we do clinical trials is that we don't know until we put it in a person how the whole person will react with the experiments in the lab we can give individual cells massive doses of drug and um, but obviously we can't do that to patients yeah and joe i wonder if we could end by one question with you uh, one thing we get questions all about all the time at Leukemia Care is about food and TKIs and what foods people can and can't eat. And I wondered whether you could share some insights on that for people that are listening before we wrap up today. I can't. I mean, obviously, I don't I don't I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, other panelists, I don't think there's any foods that are prohibitive, but when we're talking about managing side effects um, and long-term prognosis, having good overall health is important and um, being fitter and healthier often helps you to, uh, you know, to be able to tolerate medications better, although that rule doesn't hold fast. And uh, I don't mean, I I don't mean to sort of, um, to shame anybody in any way. I certainly, if I uh, have a diagnosis, I would reach for quite a lot of cake. Um, And I don't think that's unreasonable. Um, I think just general overall, keeping your cardiovascular uh, health good with uh, get your heart pumping a couple of times a week, Um, lots of fruit and vegetables. I I know gut biome is, you know, very fashionable at the moment. Uh, I'd probably watch one of those Dr. Michael Mosley programs on the BBC. Um, I think there's all really good sound advice for uh, your, you know, your overall health. Um, and certainly with medications such as nilotinib, where there's, you know, long term accumulative uh, problems with the cardiovascular uh, system, that's certainly very good advice to lower your other risks, i.e. your risk of, of diabetes and, and heart disease, which would be no better or worse than the rest of the population. Um, but you obviously will have two risk factors then. So I think just for your health, for your mental well-being, um, to eat a balanced, healthy diet, to get some form of calm and meditation uh, into your life and to uh, to do some exercise. And also, as they say, to do something that's external to yourself, whether that's volunteering or getting involved in other things um, that, that stops you from internally ruminating um, about your risk, which I know is easier said than done, um, but there's certainly lots of evidence to say that looking for uh, looking uh, for that perspective and working uh, with other people or otherwise called counting your blessings uh, as well. It's just really healthy for your mental health and it is difficult living with a chronic illness um, and I can completely understand why that affects people's mood. So health, exercise, um, healthy eating, uh, they're all good ingredients for for all of our lives, um, but especially so if you're living with chronic illness. Sorry, that was a little bit sort of woolly, wasn't it? No, no, that's good advice. And I'll, I'll come to Melanie in case she wants to add anything in a moment. But we've just had um, someone ask about grapefruit. And I think um, it's the it's the citrus fruits that confuse people a lot. So I don't know whether uh, Adam, Murray, either of you want to add anything on the citrus fruit front. Because, it's yeah, like I said, something we hear all the time from patients and some confusion. Add something to the chat. So... Um, you do need to avoid grapefruit, grapefruit juice and Seville oranges because they will put up your um, levels of um, TKIs because they are metabolized in the liver by the same enzymes and, as the TKIs and they, they can increase your side effects by increasing the levels of the drugs. So definitely need to avoid them. But there's not really any other foodstuffs that I'm aware of that you you should avoid. You should avoid St. John's wort as a a herbal remedy, but of all all other food stuffs, everything in moderation. Great, thank you. I hope that's clear for everyone and will clear up the debate, although I'm sure it will still rage somehow. Um, Melanie, uh, to give you the the last word then um, on, you know, how you cope day to day with with your treatment and your diagnosis of CML. Anything you want to add over and above what Joanna said a minute ago? Um, I think what Joanna said was really nice. Um, Finding a sense of purpose, despite my limitations, has been very important for me. Um, A few months after I was diagnosed, I decided to find a hobby which was consistent with being tired all the time. And I learned how to crochet. And now I make crochet gifts for everyone. (laughs) 
and it really cheers me up. I get photos of um, children, my, my friends' children playing, and that really definitely cheers me up. So finding something you like to do. And on days when you feel really bad, I like to listen to audiobooks um, because reading can be difficult if you have a headache or something. So I like listening to audiobooks and don't watch Netflix too much because in the end, it doesn't help. <laughs> That's my <laughs> personal advice. But sometimes binging on a Netflix series is good, but just I try not to do it too much. Great. Thank you for that. Um, I also am a lover of crochet, so I, oh. it's, very, it, it's very mindful, isn't it? I, it I, is. I, it's I very agree relaxing. With that it is, yes. Uh, thank you to all of our panellists today. I hope there was something in there for you, whether you were di newly diagnosed or whether you have been um, treated for CML for a long time. I think we've talked about some really interesting next steps. Um, thank you all for your time. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, so just to finish off the, the webinar then, I uh, just wanted to remind everyone of the various services we have here at Leukemia Care. Um, we are doing um, webinars throughout the year now and we plan to continue those for some time so um, hopefully you will um, see those in our newsletter which is very important to sign up to if you're interested in future ones next slide please and also our podcast if you're interested in hearing more about from particular people um, we try to have a good range of people on the podcast um, if you enjoy audiobooks like melanie does then um, i can recommend the podcast to hear other patient experiences next slide please and um, just to remind you of all the support services, if you want to talk through anything you've heard today, side effects or treatment options, anything like that, um, do get in touch with us. Got a helpline. Um, if particularly interested in clinical trials and sort of non-standard treatment options, our advocacy service can also help you with that. Um, next slide, please. And just to remind you that we have a counselling fund if you um, are struggling to access support um, for your psychological and mental well-being and you want some professional help, um, we do have a fund um, for that purpose that's um, open to everyone. And um, we'll leave up our contact details for a moment while I thank our panellists once again for their time. Thank you so much um, for, yeah, for taking time out of your day to talk to the patients today. It's been um, really, really interesting. And um, have a wonderful afternoon, everyone, and we'll see you again another time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.